it's all aimed at making a better world. I mean, I still maybe in a way still believe in the 20th century dream that Akhirat could contribute to a better life. Zaha Hadid was one of the most innovative and influential architects of our time. She was the first woman to receive both the Reba Royal Gold Medal and the Pritzker Prize. But how did this Iraqi math student become the most famous architect in the world? Zaha began her studies at London's AA in the early 1970s. Under the guidance of her tutors, including Bernard Shumi and Rem Koolhaas, and inspired by the Russian suprematists and constructivists, Zaha's paintings and drawings portrayed lines of movement like no one else. You know, when I first met Zaha, I knew that she was exceptional. I met her at DAA because Alvin Boyarsky asked me to come to her crit. And I did not know Zaha, and uh, the crit was not only for Zaha, but for a few people in her studio. And she behaved as if she was the tutor. <laughs> she <laughs> dominated uh, the studio. She kept telling everybody what to do. So I just of suddenly, when she started presenting her project, so to my greatest surprise, I found out that she was a student. And I've never forgotten it because she explained her project. I don't know exactly what the project was, but I do know that she spent a long time talking about the Russian constructivist, which is, of course, the subject very close to me. I think it's well known that the period at the AA that I'm talking about was very special and people are picking over it now, wondering how and why it was so special. And of course it was to do with personalities, but it was also to do with the system and the setting. You know, a row of beautiful Georgian houses in Bedford Square in a traditionally academic part of the city. And, um, and yet we were imagining entirely new scenarios for cities and what, what role architecture could play in that. Um, it was brilliant. I'm told when Zaha's drawings were first exhibited, they had a profound influence on everybody who saw them. Uh, they were just a, a completely new approach to um, to looking at the city and at the plan. Uh, they were obviously um, very uh, influenced by um, her preferences in art. And I think they really expanded what we thought of by an architectural drawing. I mean, what they, what they could be um, and how they might influence the final form of the building. Hong Kong was the first big one that got international coverage, which wasn't built, but it kind of revealed a vision and a way of communicating architecture which had never been seen before. I mean, people were seduced by the drawings, but they couldn't really understand them. That was kind of, oh my God, how do we read this? But they somehow seduced you into believing that there was some other kind of architecture which was less confined by gravity, which was more to do with slippage, and let's say the dynamics of geology and the earth, like rock moving, was something that inspired her.
the Vitra fire station was Zaha's first major completed project. The building was commissioned by Vitra's Ralph Felbaum in 1990 after the factory complex had been destroyed by a fire in 1981. Completed in 1993, the building feels very much like being inside one of Zaha's early drawings and its sharp lines and angular walls can be seen in the abstract and futuristic strokes of her earlier work. It proved that Zaha would not just be a paper architect. Zaha had a very long period when she did not build anything. And now, since I met her when she was still a student, and then when she left school and became a, became a teacher, and we kept on winning competitions, but not really being still terribly far from any construction or because um, her drawings were not kind of promising that they could, they could be built. And they were far too abstract, um, probably for the developers or people who decide of what is built and what is actually put in practice. The, the Vitra building was um, her earliest independently standing building and it was built as a fire station, it wasn't built as a gallery. So uh, it represents its time and her thinking at that time and the way that her studio was formulated and the ideas that were circulating at the time. But I think it's, it's, there's an absolute continuous evolution of the ideas and her role in generating them, I think she became more open to looking and learning and being kind of open to possibilities that perhaps she couldn't have had without, you know, the collaborative environment with Patrick and others. Well, it took a while actually to design. Uh, we were very ambitious with our architecture. This was a manifesto building for us, and it turned out to become a manifesto building. But it, the, the program was very mundane and had various parts, like the, a big garage part and a series of small adjunct buildings, which didn't lend itself easily initially to, to, to our conception of architecture. So. So it took a while. We were also immature and young, and all of us. So it took unusually long to design it and to be satisfied. The client kept asking, was I already happy many, many times over, and we were unwilling to release the design. So we, over, we overworked it incredibly, but it was worthwhile for us, I think. And then it took quite a while to also develop the drawings, and, and, and construction for a small building took relatively long. It's all fair face concrete, very, very pristine, sculpted um, of forms. So it was, a, it was a slow birth. And all through the 90s, we, we, we had only very few opportunities and small buildings. There's some got done. Quite a, the larger projects we had started in the, in, the, in, in the early 90s were aborted, which happens a lot. We didn't realize that this is quite normal. <laughs> we were very disappointed. But since the 2000s, uh, we picked up so much work that a lot of it also got realized, while still the majority of designs don't get realized. By the time it completed in 2010, the Maxi building in Rome became Zaha's largest project to date. The building, which took 11 years to complete and had negotiated six changes in the Italian government, opened to a mixed reaction from critics, many of whom were concerned Zaha's trademark sloping walls and sweeping spaces would make it difficult to display art. 
but the building went on to win the Stirling Prize, being crowned the best building by a British architect in 2010. The whole story of Maxi starts in, uh, in, 18, in 1998. This is when it was decided by the progressive governments of the time that an old uh, military infrastructure uh, was going to be uh, demolished. And at that place, we would um, construct the National uh, Museum for Contemporary Art and Contemporary Architecture. I can still remember her walking into the room of the culture ministry and uh, I can still remember her description of the project when it was only maquette and uh, she described it as uh, a way of reinterpreting the uh, baroque um, culture and environment of, of Rome and uh, so that's when the whole Adventure started. I was on the the, the panel which um, uh, went through all the submissions and was present when they, the architects uh, m made their presentations in Rome, which was a pretty memorable few days because there was Rem Koolhaas, there was Jean Nouvel, there was uh, uh, Suto de Mura, and there was Zaha. So you know the, these were two pretty intense days with a jury which was nearly as intense as the present presenters. And, and what Zaha's project did better than any of the others is to stitch in the scheme with her sort of serpent-like uh, structure to um, these series of buildings around it in such a way that uh, was much more than some of the parts. It sort of woke up the neighborhood without being actually, it's not from outside a completely over-the-top building. Um, it's actually quite gentle the way it, 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 it touches the surrounding building. So from the outside in, I think it, it was a building which actually said something and would bring new energy uh, and, and, and life to that pretty sleepy part of middle class Rome. And it's done that. Maxi is, it says it all in the name really, although it means the museum of the 21st century to everyone universally it sort of maximizes the sense of uh, of space and that's controversial because the hand of the architect at maxi is so strong that it's said to compromise the way exhibitions are staged there i think it's exciting and i for one would love to be able to curate or stage an exhibition in which i would actually use it uh, the way it was intended, that the, the parallel sweeping lines on the ceiling were meant to suspend artwork. We were ready to adopt a certain type of computation early on because our work had been pre-digitally signaled the desire for complexity, for curvilinearity, for complex surfaces. So Maxi is definitely a step more complex and has more curvature than Vitra, but it's still, compared to the, the recent work, uh, um, was more controlled. And that was a very important step to say, we've convinced ourselves about uh, the beauty and viability of this work, but we are not convincing anybody else. So we had to make a big effort to make these ideas tangible with uh, large models, 3D computer models, but also with a slightly constrained and restrained palette. I think that was very important strategically. It was an important project for her and a touching project because it was the last of the handmade uh, as opposed to, of course the computer was used, but a lot of, the, of the, the sculptural forms and investigations were done through those extraordinary cardboard models. Then, yes, tested on the computer and all that. There's a whole generation of buildings since then in, done by the practice which start from the computer. And I think you can actually feel that. And, and I think her passion for the building, she literally said it, I, 
I, I rem that building was so important for me. There was also Rome, you know, Rome, Rome for Zaha, which is a Baroque figure, you know, voluptuous in every sense, you know. The, um, she enjoyed the drama that she created on, on, on the streets and uh, the headlines at the time were La Borromini, you know, the, the female Borromini has come 400 years after. Uh, and of course she roared with laughter and thought this was absolutely hysterical. In 2004, Zaha was chosen to design the Aquatic Centre for the London 2012 Olympic Games. The building, like many of Zaha's other projects, was heavily influenced by landscape and the city and was designed to reflect the surrounding park. Her first major building in London, the project propelled Zaha into the public eye. Zaha's scheme was one of the few which was totally clear about what should happen during the games in order to accommodate 17,000 people uh, in terms of ticket holders and what should happen after the games when it should be a wonderful but in the end community pool. I remember going to an event which was the celebration of the legacy building where um, there was uh, divers and everything else and lights and music and everything else and you could finally see what Zaha had had in her mind all the time and that's what thousands of kids and adults use every week now I mean that's real legacy for uh, a, a, a building of that sort you know I, I think it was Anish Kapoor when she died that night on uh, Radio 4 or um, talked about the fact that you know anyone doing backstroke <laughs> in, in that pool looks up and sees this ribbed um, timber roof which she had conceived and all of those who swim doing the backstroke and it's a very nice idea actually get that experience that she had in her mind. I mean she she was a natural star in many ways. She always felt special at the school already as a student she was treated as a star student. She was very early on exhibited uh, in with OMA and MoMA early already and then again at the the constructivism show at the ICA in London. So for her, and she was an internal star, I con considered her to be a star within the discipline. Gradually this became more, it was not architectural magazine, but became then a Vogue and Bazaar, Harper's Bazaar or a broadsheet paper. Um, uh, that just happened. and. Uh, but she didn't change so much through this, we didn't change, our relationship didn't change. She was very approachable and we were all a big family here. As she became more and more famous, I think what tended to happen was that she uh, kind of ex expanded the whole consumption of design. So I used to find in recent times young children would know her name, which is fairly rare. You know, girls' school that I did a lecture at, I remember. People knowing, knowing who she was. So in a, in a way, she expanded the whole palette of design as she became more and more famous. So we could relate her to ordinary objects, we could relate her to very large-scale buildings. And the, the fame never really um, made her big-headed, in my opinion. But what he did do is raise the whole profile of architectural design, raise the profile of what we all do. Yet, she didn't change a huge amount in the time I knew her. She still had a tendency to be shy, even though people don't read it that way. She had a tendency to be loyal to, to the work and very, very forceful about what she wanted and what she didn't want. So these things um, were the things that I don't think changed, because as a person, I don't believe she changed enormously. I just think the way we consume the work improved as it became more and more visible and experiential to, to people. At 
At the time of her death, Zaha's practice had more than 60 active projects. The legacy of the studio she created will live on through this work. Zaha left an indelible mark on architecture, creating her own unforgettable style which pushed the boundaries. It, you know, it's very difficult to talk about legacy for, for, for anyone and I think architecture is such a thing that it, aside from agriculture it's one of the only things you leave behind. Most of us go without leaving behind what we did. So she's ahead of her time in that sense that as an architect you do leave something behind. But most of her buildings were so unique and the geographical spread across communities that I, I think the legacy of how people use those buildings, how we experience them today, this whole idea of um, multiple perspectives that you see in the Fino Science Center, for example, when you walk through it, the experience is so unlike any other building. It's almost close to nature. Baku, the, the Azerbaijan project, similar. The multi-perspectives that people talked about. The idea of movement in a static building. When you see it, it feels like it's moving. Those kind of legacies of how we experience the use of those buildings, but also what our eye takes in, in terms of shape, technology, I think are, are, are legacies. From my own perspective, the legacies, I, I would say, is the, advance of, the advancement of technology. I think Zaha expanded the um, definition of architecture. She expanded what was conceived as possible. Um, those buildings that were once uh, thought of as unbuildable, as concepts or as pieces of art, um, as they became realized, uh, it really opened the eyes of clients and of the public on what space could be. I don't think I have to say when she said that she didn't like to be to be called a woman, a women's architect. She was not. She was the architect. Well, Zaha made it quite public in interviews and um, radio programs um, and, and, and interviews with the press that she, from an early life made a compromise uh, that in order for her to execute her art a lot of other things has had to be put aside and she mentioned this you know relationships family so there was somewhere in her in her heart and her mind this total dedication to what she believed in you know, and uh, um, the creativity comes with a sort of psychological uh, strength which was also touching when she, um, in the gold medal, showed pictures of, um, at the age of 12, rearranging her furniture, and her mother saying, okay, you, <laughs> you de redecorate your room, I'm not gonna ask someone else to do it, because, you know, anyway, you're gonna have your own way. And I think, you know, that, that was all the way until the day she went to Miami and then never came back. She's left, uh many traces that will endure for a very long time. I mean, she became the most famous architect in the world, and a woman, and an Iraqi. I mean, that's pretty impressive. So as a person, she leaves great inspiration because she was courageous and, you know, rarely compromised and uh, stuck to her guns. And I think we have to sort of uh, um, see the work as an inspiration for real architecture and try not to um, worship her too much. I think she was a, an extraordinary figure, but people need to be confident enough to perhaps continue the experiment and let it evolve into something else. And I wish that on the office and on uh, you know, other students of architecture and architects of the future that it's that the, it's, it's, it's a, her work is a body of inspirational material. I think it was 
massive, massive impact. Um, the degrees of freedom a designer now has has been massively expanded by her. The way she was able to use the rapid hand movement, the calligraphy of fluid pulsating curvatures to be a legitimate architectural possibility was very important. And that has been picked up by many others, by a whole new generation of architects. And I think that's we're still at the beginning of uh, impacting the built environment with this new degrees of freedom, which are new repertoires and new problem solving repertoires, therefore. Um, so the legacy is, I think, growing. It's now down to future generations of architects to continue Zaha's legacy of experimentation and innovation.